can start 10 seconds now. So we're live. I'm sorry, can everyone hear properly? We just heard that, but before, we didn't hear anything. Yeah, I agree. I, I went live and then I heard nothing. Maybe someone could introduce our guests. We just heard that, but before, Okay. Can are we starting? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, we can hear you fine. <laughs> What's At least going I on? think you're on mute. Okay, now we're good. So yeah, I was kicked out. Okay, so we're starting. Um, it is with great pleasure that I welcome Lola Shepard and Mason White to FIU's public lectures. Based in Toronto, Canada, their research and practice has made a point of embracing the multiplicity of design traditions and conceptions of space or spatial practices that a territory such as Canada and arguably any territory or nation presents. The pre-modern or traditional practices held by First Nation communities in relation to the problematic legacy of colonial importations and Southern impositions, which tickles me since usually it's attributed to the North as the imposer, but there is also a North of North as a periphery, can only be understood and acknowledged through careful inspection and questioning of given narratives, through oral histories, mapping, drawing, writing, tools that pry open the knowledge of vernacular practices, making them known and valued. Lateral Office was awarded the Emerging Voices from Architectural League of New York in 2011, and in 2010, the Professional Prix de Rome from the Canada Council of the Arts. Both Lola and Mason have edited important publications such as Bracket, Architecture, Environment, and Digital Culture, and Pamphlet Architecture, which they pursued as directors of another very interesting initiative they also lead, Infranet Lab. They are the authors of Many Norse, which I have enjoyed rereading in preparation for their lecture today. It is a result of research through the Wheelwright Fellowship from Harvard and the RAIC Award. The publication brings awareness to how much is lost through deductive, reductive categorizations of Nordic cultures and how recognition of their knowledge through different frameworks of spatial understanding, more uh, such as networks, ecologies, and infrastructures, um, reveals the potential of a suppressed vernacular. And I quote from their um, text, when confronted with the imperative to be Northern architecture has overlooked the intelligent characteristics of traditional structures. They are impermanent, adaptive, and collaborative. Lola and Mason advocate for more nuanced understandings of territory, ones that will generate greater richness and complexity embracing all scales and perhaps forgo more conventional forms of control and design. 
which reminds me very much of Stan Allen's message in his essay, Field Conditions, where he points out how problematic architects' impulse of control has been for design. As practitioners, researchers, and amazing professors, I believe it is this three-pronged perspective that has produced what I see in Lola and Mason, a most sensitive, poignant, practical, and relevant approach to our discipline. I have enjoyed observing them over their years since our times together at the GSD and look forward to future concurrences and exchanges in space and time. And so I believe uh, Tommy will present Lola and then Tatiana will present Mason. With pleasure. Um, Lola Shepard is a registered architect and founding partner at Lateral Office. She received her Bachelor of Science in Architecture and Bachelor of Architecture from McGill University and a Master of Architecture from Harvard Graduate School of Design. She is professor at the School of Architecture, University of Waterloo, where she also served as the undergraduate officer. She has taught at the University of Toronto, Ohio State University, and California College of the Arts. She is committed to architecture's new relationship to social and ecological possibilities, not just solutions. She is the recipient of the 2012 Royal Architecture Institute of Canada Young Architect Award and the 2003-2004 Howard Lefebvre Fellowship from Ohio State University. Hello. So Mason White is a founding partner at Lateral Office. He is a fellow of the Royal Architectural Institute of Canada. White received his Bachelor of Architecture from Virginia Tech and his Master of Architecture from Harvard Graduate School of Design. He is currently a professor at the Daniels Faculty of Architecture, Landscape and Design at the University of Toronto. He has taught at Harvard University, Cornell University, Ohio State University and UC Berkeley. White is convinced that there are new roles for architecture out there that we do not know because we are not looking, really looking. He is the recipient of the 2012-2013 Howard Freeman Visiting mm -hmm. Professorship in the Practice of Architecture at UC Berkeley College of Environmental Design and the 2008-2009 Arthur Wheelwright Fellowship from Harvard Graduate School of Design. Thank you so much for the introduction. And uh, it's, uh, you know, Alyssa was reminding me as she was speaking that we did an amazing studio together actually with Alejandro Aravena um, that was, I think, mm -hmm. uh, probably formative for many of us in terms of shaping how we uh, think. And I think the, the lineage of that, um, both the kind of wonderful collaboration in the studio, but also the sort of individual projects probably shaped both our trajectory. So it's really nice to be back here. Uh, sharing sharing work with you. Um, so let so, so I think first we we um, as is customary and as should be done, we'll we'll just respect the uh, respectfully acknowledge the land on which we're zooming to you from, um, which for thousands of years has been the traditional land of the Huron, Wendat, the Seneca, and most really recently the Mississaugas of the Credit River. And of course today we're in a digital space um, and conceptual place that we are meeting in as well as the meeting place of Toronto that we're in um, are still the home to many indigenous peoples uh, from across Turtle Island. And we're grateful to have this opportunity to live and work on this land. And, and we hope you also will uh, explore the um, uh, land in which you uh, are zooming from or in which you are currently together um, and recognize the indigenous contributions to that land and its stewardship. Um, and in honor of uh, the multitude of twos, 22nd of the second month of 2022, Lola and I decided to do this as a pair to keep the theme of twos going. So we're, uh, we're going to, I believe, alternately present work. And, and sometimes we might quibble a bit and argue with how each other is describing the project. I think this is maybe how our collaborative life partnership has survived is the ability to misunderstand uh, projects or uh, perceive projects in different ways. Um, 
So we'll see where this goes. We don't often get to lecture as pairs. This is why this is special. Zoom affords sometimes uh, the ability for us to both be in the same space. So um, the project, the, the lecture talk is, is related to a, a series of work we've been doing on this idea or notion of remoteness and how that of course is in the eye of the beholder of what remote means. But what, and also this idea of territory, a sort of powerful word that can have political connotations, which we accept and should acknowledge these political implications of both of these words. And so we're putting them out there because they are problematic. Um, but what we think that these problematic terms do is they do offer a potential for recharacterizing architectural practice, which we like to call spatial practice. We find it to be more inclusive. We find it to be embrace different notions of um, and scales in which spaces can operate from the very small scale of an object to the very large scale of land and territory. And we also are excited by this complex sort of political uh, notions of remote territory in terms of what it might offer typologically or what we might call new vernaculars, which is obviously a playful uh, contradiction, right? Vernacular implies something that is originary and uh, emerges from up and the new implies something maybe more imposed. So this idea of recognizing different forms of architectural practice as being more spatial and the possibility of typologies is having both uh, impositions uh, that might emerge from, uh, from below or originarily, let's say, um, and the possibility of those to be recognized anew. Um, and we'll start off maybe with uh, a series of questions and um, we'll, we'll table to the, the room. What is the rural and remote territory today? Uh, obviously we have an, an urban bias in our thinking and this has been sustained by many thinkers from uh, modernists like Doxiades to uh, Dutch thinkers like Kulhas and, and others that have been looking at um, kind of continuous urbanization or um, uh, urbanization that is um, uh, yeah, chain, chaining together um, cities or urban regions. But of course, behind these, this urbanization is a, uh, a other, other advocates like um, Neil Brenner has written a lot about planetary urbanization and how, in fact, urbanism is more than just this prior notion of a continuous uh, urbanism within a region, but instead starts to entangle one continent or one region with another. And so you have this um, codependence, if you will, between a hinterland and a city in terms of material supply, in terms of labor, in terms of resources, uh, et cetera. And this fuels a kind of global economy um, and, and, and this fuels haves and have nots. Um, and, and Brenner and many others have written about this, uh, this idea about uh, a study of planetary urbanization. And it's interesting here that looking at the cover of this book that it doesn't, it's, it talks about planetary urbanization, but it shows no city. All it's showing is a site of extraction to show what is left in the wake of that urbanization. And we've also seen um, uh, a thinker like Ram Kohas at OMA and AMO, um, recent curiosity in the countryside, this, this kind of uh, region or area, this pastoral area that maybe previously had been thought to be quite romantic and, and represent maybe leisure and represent agriculture and these notions, but in fact, uh, cool House and others in this countryside exhibition were observing that it's full of political turmoil, uh, flex farming, genetic experiments, uh, industrial nostalgia that has all these kind of curious, um, in, a, in a 21st century way, has all these kind of curious uh, programs or a curious kind of residue that's between remote or rural conditions that maybe were more categorizable in the 19th century or 20th century, but now are more conflicted or uh, complex or um, uh, yeah, em embody um, deeper anxieties within a capitalist economy. Um, and so what, what, the reason why we're, we're looking at this, of course, is because uh, the country that we, the nation, the land that we are in, Canada, has a conflicted history um, related to this notion of rural and urban regions, um, agriculture, uh, extraction, uh, urbanization, 
and 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 actually has proved a very compelling um, petri dish in which to observe some of these conditions. Um, so we have turned our eyes primarily inward, and there will be a mix of projects that we will show. Some of which are distinctly Canadian, maybe as you might think of it, and some maybe unexpectedly so. But this is a study of uh, Canada's lands showing um, this range between very, very remote. So what you see is white space here, um, and actually yellow are, are roads. Maybe this is a good way to look at this. So are, are the primary um, road lines. So you can see a high majority of Canada's north is not even accessible by road. It is only accessible either by air or accessible by boat. And these typologies have emerged um, that we observe that run the range between how does distinguish between a rural space and a remote space. So let's say a remote space in this bottom left corner maybe has a character where it's remote, uh, sparsely distributed, and is, is along an edge. Um, or you might sometimes have medium density, remote, linear. So this kind of bottom row looking at three different conditions of remote. Uh, actually, also the top left is a fourth condition of remote. And, and then the other four are looking at a, um, different typologies of rural accumulation. Um, and they're of course shaped by, by sort of geography. So you get you know towns along coastal edges, towns along riverways. Um, when it's more distributed, it's often kind of farmland. So one can start to read the practices of the land based on the distribution of, of the red dots of, of sort of settlement as well. Maybe an interesting case study here is the, the province of Saskatchewan, which you can see um, it, it's kind of um, cardinal and ordinal uh, subdivisions of different regions, which are all kind of population blocks, or um, I guess they would be called counties in, in the US, and, and that it shows these sort of uh, subdivisions. But interestingly enough, this northern portion, which is very sparsely populated, uh, is just one kind of catchment area, um, which, which only has, I think it's a 4.6, uh, sorry, it's spread out across 46% of the province, but only 3.5% of the population. So this shows, Saskatchewan maybe is an, a quick way to sort of read this, this, this gradient from um, its, its one uh, urban location, Saskatoon, to its rural subdivisions, to then its more remote category. And th that these are ways geographically in which, and cartographically in which we might understand um, those distinctions. But another question maybe to ask is how might spatial practice redefine rural and rem remote territories? Um, and and a, a useful way we have found to think of this and what became, as Lisa was pointing out, uh, the, the premise behind the Many Norths book was a, a study of a way in which Northern indigenous people, in this case, Inuit, um, observe land use. So this is a land use map from the seventies, uh, looking at hunters and gathering um, information through interviews and discussions with hunters uh, about where they find certain um, food groups, um, whether it be narwhals, seal, caribou, etc. And that this became a way in which um, the government of Canada began a negotiation or a conversation around land, um, an understanding of how the land was being used. What this map also reveals, if you think back to that Canadian map of whiteness, which which many of us associate with emptiness, is is that in fact it's not empty. That that land is very much practice, which goes back to this idea of spatial practice, and that there are indigenous practices, there are femoral practices, there are you know colonial practices happening on this seemingly empty space. And in other regions. Um, for example, here in Ghana, um, I'm not sure if we'll be showing this project per se, but this was a study we did looking at electronic waste and looking at its impact globally as a kind of toxic colonial impact. Its impact as toxic, toxic colonialism in certain regions of the world where uh, North America or Europe might send its electronic waste, which has some hazardous materials in it, to other regions, such as uh, a region in Pakistan, a region in China, and a region in near Ghana. And so this is a photograph of one of these sites in which spatial practitioners are essentially partitioning this waste and categorizing it and creating um, uh, a kind of management system in which to transition this electronic waste towards more useful uh, purposes. 
Uh, a third question we might ask is, how might we recognize new vernaculars in rural and remote territories? And an example here, for example, is um, Temple Grandin's uh, understanding towards a more sort of civil and a more um, sensitive uh, management of cattle um, going to slaughter and, and what might be what might be a possible typo new typology uh, corral that would facilitate that kind of ethical um, dilemma. And Temple Grandin was obviously not trained as an architect and right and so that means that saying that this is an architectural practice um, problematizes it professionally, but saying that this offers a new vernacular and that Temple Grandin is a spatial practitioner allows us to invite Temple Grandin into um, the practice and to influence that uh, thinking. Um, another possibility might be to think about something like a data center, which maybe are partially designed by architects. Sure, somebody's stamping these drawings, but this is a new typology, right? This is a typology. Maybe we could even say that this is the 21st century's newest architectural typology um, is a data center, uh, a building um, purely constructed for the management of heat and water demands of servers, all right? This, this obviously did not exist as a typology. Um, uh, prior. So, I mean, one of the things I think uh, sort of the critique of, of people like Brenner and Kulhas that a book like Many Norse, which I'm going to talk about now, um, tries to address is this, this sort of flattening of, uh, in their view of the hinterland or the remote or the, or the rural or the agricultural is somehow in, in seeing it in service of the city, it really uh, erases the kind of cultural particularities, the spatial practices, et cetera. And so part of um, our work, especially in a book like Many Norse, was to uh, document and track these uh, many spatial practices. So Many Norths um, is a book uh, that we worked on uh, you know, over about a 10 year span. Um, and so to kind of orient you, this is a map of uh, only sort of documenting the communities north of 16 Canada. Um, and it's, you know, now about 130,000 people living north of 60 in these very tiny distributed communities. The two largest are about 22,000 people. Um, and then you quickly go down to 8,000. And then after that, you're dropping to a few thousand or a few hundred. And so the, the challenges of, um, of living in the north in this kind of isolated uh, distributed communities raises some interesting questions to designers we felt. Um, and a photo like this, you know, remind, I think for us reminds us that um, there is inhabitation in the north. It isn't, you know, only polar bears and glaciers as the sort of national geographic images would suggest. There is inhabitation um, and there are infrastructures that enable this inhabitation, but always sort of challenged by geography and climate and that those are always shaping daily life. And the other thing that fascinated us about the North is that it is a place um, where we have imposed colonial structures, literally architectural structures, language structures, education structures, health structures. And the project for Indigenous people in Canada over the last sort of 30 years has been to decolonize these practices and reclaim them and integrate their own practices into kind of hybrids. Um, so this is a, a small town in Nunavut. Um, and you see the kind of uh, bungalows that were imposed by Southern Canadian government officials. But then you also see the snowmobiles and the jerry cans, which are this kind of spatial practice and daily life kind of percolating up um, against the kind of imposed structures. Um, this photo is one we've always loved. It, it's um, a school done by a well-known Quebec architect who believed that technology was the answer to all of Northern Canada's problems. Um, and so you see this kind of surreal modernist structure, you know, which is both fascinating and problematic, sort of sitting on what he perceived as a lunar landscape. And then these Inuit youth of the day dressed in kind of 1970s bell bottoms. Um, this is when the school opened in 72. And so you see the confrontation of kind of modernity and, and traditional uh, culture sort of uh, conflating here. So one of the questions when we started to do the book was how do you even define North? Um, you know, you could define it by the Northern Territories. Um, you could define it by, uh, there's a tax benefit line for um, that, that sort of offers some reimbursement recognizing the challenges of living in the North. Um, you could define it in ethnographic terms, the, the regions where Inuit people inhabit. 
Um, you could define it by the tree line, the point at which there are no more trees, which is of course changing with climate change. You could define it by the line of continuous permafrost, which is also changing with climate change, to so the point at which the ground is permanently frozen. You could define it by ecozone. You could define it by uh, southern road access, the point at which there's no roads, et cetera, et cetera. And so what became clear to us early on is that there are many Norths, hence the title of the book, and that depending on what, what you're looking at, um, the, the region you might, the, the way you frame the region might change. And this I think has been very instrumental in our work. So the book um, seen here in the snow um, was organized into five chapters, two maybe more uh, familiar topics of urbanism and architecture, but then also um, we looked at mobility, we looked at monitoring both military and scientific monitoring, and we looked at resource extraction as, as forces that were shaping the North just as much as architecture and urbanism. And in, the, in each uh, chapter, we would look at both colonially imposed structures and um, traditional indigenous practices and, and, and kind of understood them all within a set of practices happening. And so the book had essays, timelines, case studies, interviews with specialists, et cetera. So these were some of the timelines that would introduce each chapter um, where we would look at, for instance, in urbanism policies that were um, important, uh, designs that were important in relation to that theme, et cetera. Um, so I'll show you quickly three of the case studies. Um, the first one, which really speaks to this idea of vernaculars, um, is the innovation of the snow fence. Um, so Nunavut has uh, no trees. And so you get the wind carrying the snow and blowing it across the tundra for kilometers and kilometers with no interruption. And so they developed basically a snow fence, which is like basically an artificial tree shelter belt, which is built outside of the town. So you can see on the left sort of figure grounds of towns and then these blue fences that are built outside of the town to basically slow the snow and cause it to dump at the at the fence, not in the town so that buildings don't get um, you know, completely swallowed in snow. And so here you see these kind of amazing infrastructures outside of town. And for us, this is truly a kind of Northern vernacular and innovation. Another in mobility, we looked at traditional um, Inuit practices on the land. So this was actually leveraging the work of an anthropologist who had worked with elders tracking where they move. So our role here was really to visualize. Um, we weren't doing the original research, but we we're, we're visualizing these trails. Um, we just tried to visualize based on, on research and interviews um, how they navigate on the land, um, visualizing the many kinds of snow that, you know, there's famously 40 names for snow. Um, we would document at a kind of micro scale what they bring out, bring when they go out on the land for hunts. Um, and so this idea of a kind of multi-scalar understanding of something like mobility from the regional to the kind of highly material. And then the last case study is looking at uh, in, in resources at food, um, food resources in this case, um, looking at how um, Inuit in Northern Quebec will harvest mussels. Um, and so in the summer, they will harvest by the coast. And in the winter, when the bay freezes over, they go out onto the frozen bay, which you can see in the, in the map, and then you can see both in the photo. Um, and this is a region with some of the highest tides in the world. So they will go out, they will make a hole in the ice, they take their sleds um, and use them as ladders, basically. Um, and they go out when they go down when the tide is low, they harvest these um, underground mussels. Um, there are people that stay above land to make sure the tides to kind of tell them if the tides are coming back. Um, you'll, you see the kind of calendars that we would often make to kind of speak about cycles, whether daily cycles or seasonal cycles, um, and, and the kind of architecture that the landscape makes. Um, and this is uh, a photo of um, an Inuit youth and elder sort of um, continuing this sort of spatial practice of muscle harvesting. Um, and then the book sort of ends with a technology matrix instead of a kind of conventional index, which was really an argument that, you know, architecture is but one technology uh, of permitting inhabitation in the North. Uh, the next project we'll talk about is a project we did in 2015 for the Chicago Architecture Biennale called Making Camp. 
um, which was looking at this idea of wilderness, um, which I'm sure you, is also a reputation that precedes Canada, is that it's full of wilderness spaces and spaces in which you can immerse in nature. Um, we began first with a, a, a kind of provocation from Rainer Banham in Architecture of the Well-Tempered Environment, in which he compares the, the, the um, kind of atmospheric and um, qualities in terms of heat and moisture that are produced by a tent and a fire, um, an outdoor fire. And, and this idea that even something as simple as this thin membrane uh, manages to deflect wind and exclude rain, um, and something as basic and simple as the fire has two different conditions, a zone of heat and light, and also a zone of warmed air and smoke. And this kind of observation that this, this notion of environment or thermal qualities, spatial thermal qualities, could be useful in, in contextualizing or rethinking about uh, the domesticated wilderness space. Um, we also observed that the tent as an object, the most kind of architecturally equivalent object in the question of camping, what is camping today? And are there new possibilities for camping today is, is exhausted. The tent has been over-designed. There are 8,200, you know, 82,000 different versions of forms and material envelopes and closures and external structure and internal and uh, et cetera. Um, and this wasn't some, gonna be something that we as designers had anything to contribute to or could make any novel discoveries on. Um, equally, we were intrigued by the obsession of camping culture to of gear and, and the role that gear plays in creating or re, recreating domestic space in the wild. Uh, everything from the guitar to creating clean water to creating light, heat, um, catching food, uh, all of these things, uh, preparing um, uh, wood for, for fire, et cetera. Um, and then the third aspect of camping we were, we were observing is the campsite itself, which um, many, uh, uh, many different conditions, of course they come in different forms, but maybe the most common form is this almost suburban-like cul-de-sac arrangement of individual campsites with parking spaces for each. So we thought it was interesting that despite this collective desire to get away from it all and go out into the wild and get out into nature and go into the wilderness, in fact, was just a recreation of suburban uh, conditions, which was everyone alone together, uh, kind of fighting for individual space. Um, and that all of this was happening at the base of sometimes some of the most stunning and beautiful landscapes and views. So. Um, to begin this project, we wanted to explore most of the primary gear, everything from the backpack to the Winnebago to, um, I don't know, water, um, water uh, cleansing uh, machines and, and elements and gear, and, and study when each, when each one came about and what it was the cultural context in which that would happen. Um, and this led to five schemes um, across a sort of gradient landscape. So this is a plan view looking down on a sort of model sample that we made, which would gather these five, each one of those circles is representing a different uh, ecosystem um, environment. And the black figures are little silhouettes of each of the five camping spaces. And what we were looking at was a merger between all of these elements, everything from the campsite to the tent to the role that gear played. We were trying to find a way that these could coexist into one design intervention. And just like you would as you enter a campsite or a national campground or, or, or a provincial or state campground, you would receive a, a kind of printed uh, pamphlet on newsprint, usually a, a highly recyclable paper type. We wanted each of the five, as well as the history that we observed, to be printed on this newsprint that would have the same character and would describe how each campsite um, is used. In other words, how to uh, dispose of your waste, how to find a camping ground, uh, when was the ideal time to go, uh, beware of these animals, here's what to do in case of this or that. So all of these kind of instructional kind of manual survival kit things would be printed on that document. Um, so maybe I'll try to whiz through a few of these not all of them in depth, but 
Um, let's look at this first one, which is in the foreground of this model photograph, uh, which is called closed loop. And this one is really a celebration, both in physical form and in performance in terms of process and how it operates about the idea that um, that uh, the camper that wants to leave no footprint, that wants to arrive and have all of the um, waste and kind of cleanliness uh, management of the campground happening at the site. So there's different zones. There's a zone of campfire. There's the zone of, of water gathering. There's a zone of um, cleaning pots and pans and uh, cleaning yourself and washing your hands. And then around the perimeter is, is a series of these kind of undulating fabric which is effectively a kind of um, shared uh, tent that you would pin down to claim a, a zone. So this would lend a kind of collectivity um, and individuality at the same time. And, and all of these projects were in fact looking at notions of collectivity rather than individuality in, in this uh, wilderness space. This is the uh, a flattened version, so you can see what one of these pamphlet looks like that would describes the do's and don'ts and how it works, and here's what you need to bring with you, and so forth. And a kind of postcard image of canoeing towards uh, this closed loop campground. And a lot of these were about reducing, you know, embracing the fact that camping we observed is collective, but reducing the amount of gear and being able to shed the car far earlier so that you could hike in or canoe in um, because so many of the infrastructures were integrated into the kind of collective structures offered by the architecture. Exactly, and in this case, this one, um, which was called Lookout, uh, which, was, which was literally about looking out, um, a lookout, but but was stacked vertically where the tent is, is um, kind of like uh, deployed blind. like a roller blind up in the kind of soffit space of the uh, floor above you and this, um, kind of fillet grade uh, um, thin wires along the perimeter, which allow for one to sort of pull up uh, and down gear. Um, so looking for a kind of vertical camping solution, uh, this one, and again, a kind of description about do's and don'ts and how it works and what time of year to come and, and how this was good for observing nature, good for bird watching, good for watching long migration patterns of, of, of species and animals. Um, and again, a model view of that one. This is one that was called suspend, that is suspended sort of in the canopy space of the tree, uh, which had this column that was a means of accessing this uh, otherwise tensioned kind of fabric tent that would, from triangulated spaces, you would sort of um, pop up or create a sort of gap in which to uh, sleep within um, uh, a view back to the lookout um, scheme. And uh, another scheme that was called um, um, on off, yeah, off grid, uh, which was a little bit tongue in cheek, but it was basically a way to use um, some advances in things like super Wi-Fi and this, this commentary about how people are often in their wilderness spaces, but looking for, an, because they're writing on a tablet or they're reading something or they're working on something that people would be looking for good internet connection. And you would have people walking around with their phones trying to get reception. So this would be a site that kind of celebrates high intensity reception. Um, and a fifth site uh, that was uh, looking at the, the layering qualities in the tundra and the ability that, you know, who you're traveling with or even different um, individual campers have different perceptions about uh, uh, cold and heat. And so this one was using different thermal layers that you could peel away to modify the interior climate of your tent, um, depending. And so this one was envisioned in more remote kind of Northern uh, cold climate regions. Um, I, we, we started a little bit late. Hopefully okay. we've got time for we're one or two. Debating more. which projects. Um, so this is a project uh, called Boom Bus. It was developed actually for the Oslo Biennale in Trinale in 2019. And it was looking at um, Atlantic Canada. So Newfoundland is a province that actually only joined Canada in 1949, so very late. Um, and it has a very rich uh, fishing history because as you can see from this historical map, it has this kind of amazing coastal edge of fjord and inlets, um, which made it very rich fishing grounds and the English and the Portuguese were coming 
as far back as the 1500s. Um, and there are uh, what they call outer banks fishing, so kind of further out into the ocean and then coastal uh, fishing closer to the kind of edge. Um, and so Newfoundland had really built its economy entirely on fishing. Um, and was populated with thousands of little fishing villages. Um, it also had developed a very unique vernacular um, tied to this fishing industry. So you had things like these fishing stages where you would dry fish before the kind of uh, larger industrialization of fishing. You had these fish plants, which you can see. Um, you also got a very unique typology of and morphology of towns where the buildings would all um, have sort of legs in the water because they had stages and docks um, by which to launch boats, haul fish in, et cetera. And so the whole um, province's architecture is really about navigating sort of land and water's edge. Um, however, um, in uh, 92, there was a kind of um, total collapse of the fishing industry. And um, basically overnight, a province's entire economy more or less uh, ceased. And so from that time and even preceding that, you had had this kind of gradual progression of, of towns shutting down. So the X's in this map of the province are towns that have closed, the red are shrinking, and the blue are the few towns that are still growing because they are service centers. So you have this kind of history of people migrating, of, of hauling houses, of shutting down towns as the economy of the place shifts. Um, and fishing wasn't the only sort of boom bust uh, economy. It, um, in the 80s, uh, oil extraction began, but we know that that also has a kind of limited uh, lifespan. Um, pulp and paper had sort of come and gone. Um, uh, mining had come and gone. So it's a, a, a province that has relied on kind of single or double economies that once they collapse, leave a, a kind of wake of, of sort of defunct infrastructures, which is partly what this map is looking at, sort of old mills, old fish plants, old um, mining infrastructure, all of which uh, no longer has a purpose. One of the few things that is growing um, is the tourism industry. Um, and partly because you have these lovely little towns and vernaculars, and also because you get these amazing icebergs that cleave off from Greenland and then um, basically float their way past Newfoundland. And so thousands of people every year come to view this amazing spectacle. And so we developed much like making camp a, a series of projects. We often uh, work serially um, as a way to kind of um, rather than develop a single solution, develop a multiplicity of projects that in a way are asking different questions back to a larger topic. So here we developed, um, I think it was eight or nine projects that were all about how could one leverage um, vernaculars, small scale economies, things that were already happening to, to kind of um, not, not save the place, but perhaps kind of uh, celebrate what was already there. Um, so we developed a set of models. Um, they were all actually made out of paper a bit in a kind of origami way uh, that was partly sort of celebrating the lightness of the architecture there. And then you see the model podiums are these sort of sticks that are uh, re remind one of the, of the kind of architecture of the place. Um, so here they are again, and I'll, I'll talk through maybe a couple of them. Um, so one was called the Know How Stage, um, and it was basically a, a kind of celebrating the fishing stage, and it had um, a, a workshop to kind of celebrate the sort of long tradition of hands-on making. It had a kind of one room, a, a library, because a lot of the libraries are slowly being shut down, and then a kind of classroom that was a bit of a tech hub. And so it was about a kind of knowledge exchange where young people and older people might come and um, share their kind of respective knowledges. Um, so this is the kind of model of it. Um, and you see the kind of structure half on land, half on water. Um, another project that similarly was about sort of navigating the land water relationship was called the live work stage. Um, and it was again, partly about celebrating the sort of uh, strong DIY culture in Newfoundland. It was also a kind of reaction to the sort of generic housing that is currently being built, which is, you know, the kind of huge, huge generic sort of vinyl clad 
buildings. Um, and so these were a, a collection of houses that um, each have their own sort of dock or outdoor space where people can make things or repair things. But there's a kind of co collectivity um, and a kind of um, negotiation of the landscape that is slowly being lost. Um, one last project was looking at um, issues of water. There's a huge number of towns that have boil water advisories um, and many towns where you actually have to go to a pump to get fresh water, which seems kind of crazy in 2022 in Canada. Um, so this was a building that was both sort of offering proper clean water infrastructure, but also sort of um, folding in things like aquaculture, which is growing, and a kind of community space. So again, a kind of building that was half on land, half on water, sort of folding in both functional infrastructures and community infrastructures. Um, and maybe this is the last one, actually, this was um, called the Moose Blind Village um, that plays off the sort of fascinating fact that Newfoundland um, as you saw on the map, Newfoundland basically is entirely coastal. The interior is more or less empty except for the Trans-Canada Highway. Um, but about a few decades ago, they started populating the interior with moose um, as a kind of recreational activity, but they became a kind of invasive species. That's right, for hunting, sorry. Um, and so now you, uh, you know, regularly get moose alerts and there's car accidents every week. Um, and so we thought, could we sort of leverage this idea of kind of loose tourism and interior tourism with a set of structures that might be both about like environmental uh, custodianship, learning learning about a kind of environmental management, going out hunting, et cetera. So these sets of structures in the forest of the interior that would celebrate this sort of existing practice. We'll see if we have time for two more projects here. These are a little bit shorter. Um, this was a, a, a project we've been working on off and on uh, since around 2018, um, more formally. And it's a proposal uh, with the Arctic Indigenous Wellness Foundation in Yellowknife Northwest Territories. And um, we essentially there is, you can maybe see in this image, there's uh, something listed as the Stanton Territorial Hospital, which is a very large kind of regional or territorial, as you can see, mega hospital um, that is meant to serve the entire region as a sort of primary um, care for primary care and uh, extreme uh, medical care. Um, however, this new building did not incorporate uh, indigenous notions of wellness and health. And, and so this was an, an organization advocating for that that has established a temporary healing camp over here in the bottom right. Um, which is an Indigenous Wellness Foundation healing camp that they initiated, uh, which is a series of tents. Um, and this is one of the elders and one of the advocates of Indigenous wellness, uh, Francois Paulette um, from Northwest Territories, a Dene knowledge keeper, elder, and activist, um, teaching us about uh, Dene notions of space and, and body and wellness. And um, what, this project was a collaboration with the Wellness Foundation to en en envision a, a facility. And so we developed a series of tools in which to enact this co-design uh, collaboration, which where we brought a series of offcuts of masses, massing models uh, into onto a kind of canvas um, uh, watercolor painted uh, site and began to mock up and test different massings and organization and programmatic logics. And you can see um, uh, Nicole Redvers here, uh, one of the executives at the Indigenous Wellness Foundation, holding up what a bubble diagram that was worked on that morning with a um, massing model that we were testing out with um, youth and elders uh, from different uh, communities. Um, we also walked out on the site, which is this incredible kind of red rock shield exposed, um, very difficult to grow tall trees there. All of these trees, although they're within the tree line are, are very uh, short, the, wa the, the water and ground that they sit in is often very acidic and challenging to grow in, um, but otherwise a really incredible uh, rocky landscape. In fact, the, the hospital to the north blasted a lot of that rock in order to make space for the, the mega hospital to uh, be constructed. Um, and we wanted to find some way to kind of work within the intelligence of this temporary camp that was set up, but to set up a more permanent all year round 
uh, building. So we, we wanted to acknowledge many of these on the land activities that take place, everything from medicinal herbs and, and collecting of, of natural medicines that grow on the land, with uh, the preparing of temporary structures or other cultural practices like uh, tanning and uh, wood cutting and, uh, and sage gathering, uh, et cetera. Uh, so this was the site. We were actually adjacent to the mega hospital, which is here to the south. Um, and uh, unfortunately, a Staples complex to the north, uh, good, old, good old Staples uh, up there. But it was this really great uh, land uh, to work off of. So we started um, through this collaboration. This is a kind of synthesis of reading where the, 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 the strong north wind is coming from, where are the best views, how do we want to manage public and privateness, and what are some areas maybe we'll want to leave untouched uh, through the design. So the natural clearing area became a kind of rallying point from which to avoid construction. And these three kind of programmatic activities, places to gather, places for traditional knowledge and land education, and of course, a, 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 a peaceful, quiet area in which wellness and count, counseling can take place. Because wellness there is not just about treating the body, it's about treating the mind and celebration of culture. And um, so it's not- And being uh, on the land. And being out on the land and having access to the land um, and access to each other um, across the generations. So the building really had, maybe not, doesn't look like a medical building in that regard, the way the West or the South might normally think of that. Intentionally. Exactly, yes. And so these three, kind of camps, this is the, the, the building as a kind of campus emerged where these three uh, clusters of activities, wellness, land education and gathering, as well as outdoor gathering uh, began to emerge. Um, building, we tried to use as much wood as we caught. There was one elder that was really powerful in how she always described uh, how, um, how the use of metal or steel uh, has uh, kind of um, negative implications in terms of spirit, uh, spirits and um, you know respect for um, uh, natural materials. So we were using as much wood as we can, everything from wood shingles and stone, a lot of stone whenever we could, although surprisingly it's actually very hard to find quarries in uh, Northwest Territories. Um, and this is the scheme as it began to get developed as a formal plan. Um, and we like walking through these different scenarios about how somebody might use the building and how we could even kind of organize the building into different climatic zones where you could really kind of control and, and manage the cost of, of keeping this building uh, heated uh, all, all during the colder uh, months. Um, and again, showing how outdoor space and indoor space would have this powerful relationship to one another and how the, the landscape was not a formal, it was an informal landscape, but would get a lot of use. Uh, even something like the library is not your typical sense of a library. It was almost more like a sort of family room. Uh, it wasn't necessarily that it needed places for books, but all kinds of activities, good storytelling spaces, spaces for listening, spaces for kind of oral tradition and language uh, were just as important as books. Um, or here's an, uh, a way in which someone might experience the counseling and wellness spaces. Um, this is the main uh, central kind of um, street, as we called it, where you would uh, navigate across the different programs um, with this beautiful kind of forest of, of um, columns. Um, this would be maybe a group counseling space uh, around some of this exposed rock, which is another way in which we were trying to manage the climate aspects and kind of sustainability approaches of the project. And this third person experiencing this uh, project maybe is only going to the gathering space in which they might see a cultural um, a cultural event, a drum circle, or an, uh, an event celebrating an elder, um, et cetera. And of course, there was also the outdoor space, uh, which was equally important, which happened on the sort of exposed rock, which was kind of the high point on the site. Um, so this, uh, here you can see uh, kind of the geological possibilities of incorporating rock into the building, um, which is something that we learned from kind of local knowledge and also a local architect named Gino Pin, who has incorporated this within uh, a school and a housing project. Uh, this was quite uh, useful to think about the embodied uh, warmth that comes from the earth itself and the, the rock. And, and meant we didn't have to kind of blast the rock, that we could just let it sort of, we, we could build around it almost. Exactly. Um, and ways in which people might participate in the construction itself. So we're looking at like both the process of a construction, the process of design, the process of anchoring the building onto its site, thinking about snow, thinking about rocks, um, 
Yeah, and so this this project is in uh, is still in development, um, working with the client, advocating with them to um, uh, get the government to support um, the construction of this project, hopefully starting next year. Maybe How, we'll whiz through this one. Okay, super fast. Um, so this is um, a continuation of the sort of Arctic projects, which are kind of ongoing. Um, this was for the 21 uh, Venice Biennale, um, and it was looking at the sort of relationship between the scale of the domestic inhabitation and the territorial inhabitation. And so one of the things that sort of in, both inspired us, but we were critical of is something like um, Charles and Ray Eames' famous film, um, The Powers of Ten, where they're sort of begin with a couple taking a picnic and then they zoom out by factors of 10 and then they zoom in by factors of 10. So they go from the you know, um, planetary down to the cellular. Um, but but it, it's, it's a, a kind of very objective view that doesn't recognize the kind of entanglements that different scales would register. Um, and, and what we have realized over our research in the North is that inhabitation um, and senses of home are often more profoundly felt by indigenous people when they are out on the land than when they are in housing structures that have been imposed often by Southern colonial architects, you know, whether it's in Canada, Alaska, Finland, et cetera. Um, so this idea of inhabiting the territory was, was important to us. And then the other recognition is that even in more urbanized uh, cities such as Norilsk, Russia, um, when, when can, one is always reminded um, that these cities are there usually due to sort of extractive practices and that the presence of the territory is always felt, whether it's the pipelines, the infrastructures, et cetera. Um, so we looked uh, at domestic interiors and we were worked through interviews, uh, leveraged research by filmmakers, documentarians, our own travels, etc. And so we were looking at different forms of domestic space across the circumpolar. So we um, deliberately sort of chose one place from each of the eight circumpolar nations as, as kind of embodying stories that often resonate across regions. Um, and then we were also looking at um, the work of indigenous artists such as Annie Pudukluk, um, who is an Inuit artist in Canada, um, who sort of reminds us of, of again, these sort of bottom-up spatial practices. Um, here, a family preparing food and eating it uh, on the floor, which is a traditional practice. And it's again, a kind of resistance to the sort of colonial structure of the house that has been imposed. Um, and then at the territorial scale, we were looking at everything from, you know, reindeer herding to the construction of dams, to the construction of pipelines, to mining infrastructure, all these sort of different ways that, the, that one inhabits the territory in the North. Um, and then we, um, you know, started to kind of, we, we deliberately wanted to understand the relationship between the intimate domestic scale and the territorial scale. Um, and simultaneously, we were, you know, at, at an even larger scale than, or a kind of circumpolar scale, we developed this kind of narrative map that spoke to these sort of various moments of inhabitation, um, but that happened within the scale of, of really large scale geography. So whether it's bowhead, whale hunting or mining or fishing or whatever it might be. Um, and that these spatial practices really happen at a territorial scale. Yeah, and that they and that they often um, are happening um, in, in, in the face of or, or create um, sort of entanglements and conflicts. So, you know, uh, someone will build a pipeline right where there's a traditional reindeer migration route, or um, they will build a, you know, there will be a boating happening where whale migration is happening. So this project was done in collaboration with Arctic Design Group at the University of Virginia. And um, we, we met through these two different scales. In some ways, they were very much looking at the kind of territorial scale and they were looking from the outside inward and we were looking from the inside outward. And so our collaboration was really about where the domestic meets the territorial. Um, so this unfolded podium shows the territorial uh, knowledge that Arctic Design Group gathered with the domestic knowledge that Lateral Office was working on and defined at which point there, there's frictions or collaborations or codependencies happening, almost as a way of asking, is there a distinct Arctic or Northern vernacular universally shared across these nations or what distinguishes one 
from another? And how does something like heat and power and energy and water get to these sites? Um, and, and what's the kind of political implications of that? Um, and so say, for example, this was obviously looking at Norilsk, Russia, uh, which has its own kind of, let's say, genetic code of territorial domestic entanglements. Uh, here at Iqaluit in Canada, which is in the region of Nunavut, looking at its uh, kind of genetic code of how territory fosters um, um, a distinct domestic space, and in particular related to, again, hunting practices, uh, you, how the kitchen gets used, how heat fuel. and fuel exactly is stored. Uh, what about the kind of sea lift or the kind of shipping patterns in the calendar? Um, what about waste? Uh, how, how do, so there's a kind of a waste pit over here, which is uh, fondly referred to as the dump uh, in Iqaluit. Um, yeah, or, or here in Greenland, Nook, where of course there's very distinct influences from Scandinavia, um, a kind of collision of, of knowledge between Scandinavia and, um, and Greenlandic knowledge, uh, Greenlandic people. And, and so, and, but there's also a lot of tourism. So on this left arm, for example, of the territory, it shows a kind of helicopter because there's a lot of uh, mm -hmm. Europeans that go hella skiing there and that that's part of the economy. Um, uh, and there's, uh, for example, a, a small dam that shows uh, 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 hydropower and, and uh, water reservoir, et cetera. So, so all of these, um, we arrange them in a circle in Venice in a room uh, to uh, partly to acknowledge the kind of circumpolar qualities of it, but also to acknowledge the way in which a circle is kind of non-hierarchical and shows a kind of a mutual, um, uh, you know, dependence or a mutual kind of um, uh, shared pressure um, politically, socially, ecologically. Um, and they were arranged across the room uh, with uh, along the wall, um, so these were a, a, a bit sort of picking up the, the, the um, tech matrix of the book. Basically, everything that was highlighted in blue, whether on the podium or in the house, which was a sort of what we called an object of interest, then got footnoted on the wall with a sort of more detailed explanation. So it might be a sled, it might be a specific kind of uh, indigenous knife, it might be a dam. I mean, it, we were fairly agnostic as to... Um, whether it was large scale or small scale, whether it was uh, a colonial uh, infrastructure or a traditional infrastructure. So here, um, for instance, the freezer that you see on the middle right, um, it came out of our research in Nook where um, there's such a need to store country food that they'll put a freezer in the living room, they'll put a freezer on the balcony, they'll put a freezer outside. Um, so that was you know, one object of interest or the blackout blinds that many communities need because of the 24 hours of sunlight in the summer, et cetera. Um, and so these were um, these are drawings that are sort of seeing the house as a kind of X-ray, really revealing these sort of objects of interest highlighted in blue, um, which were similarly documented in the models. So everything uh, the models were sort of all white and gray, and then these objects of interest would get highlighted in blue, like like kind of footnotes. And similarly, you can see on the podiums um, various sort of infrastructures and boats and so forth would again be highlighted in blue as, as objects or infrastructures of interest. Say for example, in this one, uh, again, of a Callowit, um, you can see a lot of important traits, like the building is lifted up off the ground, uh, which is very common so that you don't warm up the permafrost and your building doesn't subside into the ground. But then each room, we, we, of course, this isn't an X-ray, in a pure X-ray of architecture, right, as you might be asked to do on an isometric or axonometric of your design, but instead one that only has specific glasses, only specific glasses to see rooms that highlight distinct artifacts or distinct objects of interest. So, so a particular way of drawing and modeling that we ended up doing was to only see uh, these uh, key aspects or key artifacts or objects that were um, that were articulating a. Uh, 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 an attribute unique and a, and a unique um, kind of way in which that room um, is being used. And it might be in some cases a challenge. Sometimes it was dealing with overcrowding or a lack of storage space. Like one of the spaces you can see here is actually an overflowing closet dealing with the need in which sometimes to store almost nine months worth of food 
uh, waiting for the next time in which a large delivery can be made of, of food from the South uh, to combine with country food or a bedroom might be overcrowded. So, so uh, this is the installation view at the Venice Biennale this past um, fall um, uh, with some of the rooms. You can see how the, the models themselves are articulated where they're kind of mute as expressions are primarily just showing the massing of a house. But then when there's a room to see, suddenly you can see through the walls, you can see through the outside and look into that space. And these blue footnotes emerge that articulate what is of interest. And then you can go look for that equivalent on the wall, read about it. Why is it important? Why did they highlight this um, caribou head? Why did they highlight the, 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 the um, uh, support or kind of foundations of this building? And you can read about it. Um, that would be it. Um, thank you so much for bearing with us. Hopefully we didn't talk too quickly, but <laughs> um, thank you so much everyone for, for having us. Thank you, thank you. No, thank you, thank you. It was uh, tremendous. I uh, would like to have Tommy and Tatiana um, go ahead and start. Sure, I guess I could ask the uh, first question. Um, and by the way, I really like this lecture. I found it very, very interesting. Um, the question would be, uh, uh, what is lateral offices vision of the future of architecture and activism? Do you see it as a driver of change or responsive to it? That's a great question. Um, I mean, I think, you know, early on we, um, well, we, I, I'll, I'm gonna give a short story <laughs> as a way of an answer. So we began like most offices doing competitions um, because that's what you do when you graduate and you have some free time after hours on your job. And, you know, at some point you lose or you get runner up on enough competitions and you think, ah, oh, there's gotta be something better. Um, and, and that's when we started to kind of self-generate our own projects and research. And I think as we started to do that, we realized that the power of that was that you could, start to identify issues and problems, you know, because the conventional mode of architecture is um, there is a client, there is a budget, there is a site that is predetermined, the program is predetermined. And in some ways, we're there to make it pretty. I mean, in the most reductive form, you know, they're like, make it pretty and make it work. Um, but I think that our skills as designers is we're able to do research, we're able to understand culture, we're able to understand technology. We're, and, and of course, each person has a different bracket of interest. Um, and I think in starting to self-generate our work, we realized like we have, not we, but the designers have this capacity to um, identify issues, identify opportunities, and then look for, for opportunities for design. And I, and I think we see that as a, a form of kind of a, a greater agency for, for designers that in a way is maybe a kind of small scale form of activism of, of saying, you know, there are these things that have been overlooked by the design disciplines um, for too long. And I, and I think this is also why we got interested in the rural and the remote is that, you know, we're so trained in school to look at cities. I mean, my entire educational career was the city. Um, and we realized there's these sort of swaths of issues and geographies overlooked, but I'll let Mason I mean, yeah, I, I obviously agree with that. <laughs> um, the only thing I would add is that um, I think one criteria we like exploring in terms of what projects to invest our time in is if something feels like a worthwhile dilemma is when we don't know yet what the answer is. When a question is posed within the studio um, and, you know, and there's some knowledge to build on by others, it's very exciting. But then to know, like, I I'm not sure what the response to that would be. There's something very exciting about that. And it seems worth spending time on because it feels um, like some new thinking would be needed. And, and that that's, uh, I, I think that's a, um, a, an expectation we have of ourselves uh, is not just to out design something, to, to find a better design for something so much as to ask, can design do something here? Can can architecture, can design thinking do something with this uh, dilemma? So I, I, I think in, in short, hopefully it's a little bit of both, Tommy, to the question about does it lead uh, activism or does it respond to activism? Hopefully there's a dialogue between those two 
such that it can uh, do both, both and in short. Thank you for the question. Thank you, that's a great answer. Hello, uh, I, I wanna say thank you um, for being here today and for giving me a new, um, what is it called? A perspective on architecture. I know that, um, I think Alyssa has actually shown some of your work in our other class that I had with her. So it's great to meet you guys. Um, my question is, uh, you say that there are new roles in architecture that we as designers are not looking for. What do you think that we've been missing or ignoring art architecturally in the last two years since COVID started? <laughs> uh, I mean, I would say what has been very humbling about it, maybe to the profession, is that designers and architects had to slow down. I, I think where um, well, a, a lot of a lot of professions and a lot of aspects of life uh, were obsessed with speed and quickness, and I think the humbling aspect of COVID has really asked all of us to slow down. And although architecture is a slower discipline compared to others, you know, fashion, music, art, maybe um, architecture would be one of the slower disciplines. I think to ask us to slow down was actually asking us to listen a bit better. Um, I have joked before that um, I think a useful class in architectural education would be uh, a listening class, a kind of uh, how to be a good listener. Um, often we're taught to talk and how to talk and what is good talking. Uh, but I think being really good at listening um, allows one to hear and see new possibilities, um, both from others. Um, maybe it's also the basis of a civilized relationship amongst each other, whether it be collaborators, clients, um, coworkers, et cetera. But I think uh, I, I would say one, one thing COVID has um, maybe emboldened us to do even better that we aspired to do was to be really good at listening and observing. And um, I think that humble aspect has materialized. I'm, I'm quite happy with that outcome, although I got really tired of looking at the interior walls of my room during those two years, just like all of you all did too. Most definitely, right. thank you. Thank you. Can open it to questions from anybody. Um, and if you don't hurry up, I have one, so. Hi, yeah, hi, I'm Dana. Um, our, yeah. uh, we have a student here who has a question. Thank you. Um, some of the projects that you have there that you know are half on land, half on water, or you even have the building that was, buildings that were in the forest up on stilts. How do you come up with a design like that? How, do you, how does that even present itself to you to develop something that is Pretty unique, but it's particularly buildings that are, you know, off the ground to facilitate animal movement underneath them and stuff like that. I mean, a lot of um, both the building typologies, but also the program typologies, um, are actually building on. You know, in some ways, we like. <laughs> it's funny to say we try not to be too imaginative. I mean, I say that jokingly, but. I think we're really interested in, in figuring out what is already there, what's happening programmatically or economically or building type wise, and how can one either um, intersect things that perhaps were you know, operating in, in a kind of singular fashion, or how do we reinvent them you know, for the kind of 21st century, hence maybe the idea of the new vernaculars. Um, so a lot of them like the, the you know, buildings half on land, half on water are actually, is how they traditionally built. And of course, with kind of a generic sort of modern suburbanization, they've lost completely um, their own building cultures. And so in some ways we're just saying, hey, you know, like you did this before and it was amazing. It produced these amazing typologies. Why not revisit them? Um, and, and similarly for the types, like the building types in, in, um, in that project and in most of our projects, we're often trying to build on things that are already happening. Um, and, and so hopefully the innovation is in like weaving together things rather than <laughs> out, of, out of our heads kind of thing. 
Um, yes, hi. Um, uh, great lecture, um, uh, amazing um, sort of research and, and, and very joyful gra graphics and sort of support of the, of the ideas and concepts. Um, really pleased to see you know, the book and then the projects. Um, two things, um, I don't know if it's a question per se, but it's more like a, a couple of things kind of pop into my, 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 my head when you were talking. And um, one is about the, the snow fence sort of barrier protection. And it reminded me of um, Kasujo Sahima, she, when, she, when they designed the um, um, Grace Farms, building in, in, in Connecticut, um, she talked about the humble sort of fence that we see in sort of rural landscapes as, and she sees that as part of nature. Like she doesn't see that as part of like a human sort of intervention of it because, you know, with time it, beco with time it becomes part of the landscape and it becomes in a way invisible. And, um, and that was, Kind of what they were kind of envisioning with their design of the of that building, uh, that is you know quite sort of kind of discreet in the landscape and is it's very um, sort of elegant uh, position in the landscape, and then when you when you show the sort of the idea of the sort of collective tent with the kind of the circle and the sort of the space in inside or in that sort of public space uh, plaza, it. I, it, it, it sent me immediately to the indigenous uh, communities in the Amazons and how they basically provide, just built a roof where like all the, the members of the community live under that roof for a period of time and then they, they move because they're, they're nomads. They don't settle for, for long. So they basically take advantage or, or do good use of their natural resources and then they, they, they go to other places. Mm -hmm. But that has a lot to do with their lifestyle and their kind of like um, familiar configurations and you know mm -hmm. and all the relationships that they have. But um, kind of the question is uh, the, in in both cases, one highly sophisticated you know sort of example of architecture, and the other one, um, as we say, primitive, but at the same time with an amazing technology and sophistication of means, no tools and, and just uh, uh, natural resources. Both are sort of attempts of like what happens after, like what happens when either the the time sort of takes um, over the building or nature or people just are kind of moved or displaced uh, for other reasons and the, the structural elements kind of remain and nature sort of claims them back. Mm -hmm. um, because I come from a completely different environment, all of the the, the snow covered um, sort of landscape is completely exotic, and and I, I I cannot picture how nature could claim that back. Um, so I don't. I, I mean, it's just that. Well, I'm yeah. I mean, uh, a lot of interesting direction we could go with that great question, Henry. I mean, back to the to the fence idea. So the fence is basically a tree replacement because. Because there are no trees in the north, there is nothing to protect from horizontal wind. And in fact, uh, there's nothing to stop the snow, right? All it takes is anything that, you know, whether it's sand or snow, it's a particulate, right? And in, in fact, a lot of the um, Arctic is actually a desert, climatologically speaking. But um, in that particular region is very desert-like. There's not that much precipitation, but it's just the snow never goes anywhere. So it's just getting blown all around. And sometimes in an extreme event, all of that snow will get dumped at someone's door. So the fence is basically working like nature in the sense that it's replacing the role of the tree uh, because of that form of house, that form of architecture probably really shouldn't be there, right? And there's no going back. There's no unbuilding architectures uh, that, that can, you know, modern home, if you will, from, from the North, from this region. There is an unknowing. We haven't learned how to unknow things uh, as well uh, with that regard. And, and with respect to, uh, it's fantastic, your description about sort of uh, indigenous forms of gathering in the circle. Absolutely, the, the closed loop campsite is a sort of acknowledgement of that and kind of anti-grid and definitely anti-cul-de-sac and anti-suburban. Um, so this the circle was meant to create a sort of um, 
uh, equality and a kind of non-hierarchical gathering space and a notion of shared, um, recognizing that the power of, of indigenous notions of the circle as a gathering space is, is um, empowering the idea that we're all, uh, we're all sharing in this resource, we're all sharing in this land or, uh, versus a hierarchy or property values or these other kinds of notions that immediately create um, a, a kind of hierarchy. So I, th I think you picked up on two really powerful ideas about nature, uh, the relationship between nature and let's say infrastructure in the case of the fence um, and maybe Sejima's line or path um, and this, then this circle. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think your reading is, is quite uh, spot on with regard to those. Thank you. I mean, one thing I would just add is I think, you know, even in, it's interesting you say you can't imagine buildings sort of disappearing because actually in Newfoundland, that is exactly what's happening. These towns, when they get shut down because it's just wood architecture, you know, in, in 30 years, there's just nothing left, which is, which, which to me was so interesting compared to like in Europe, if you, if a town got abandoned, you'd have the residue, you'd have the archaeology because you'd have stone walls at the very least. Mm -hmm. But in Newfoundland, there will be entire towns that at some point, one will not know that there ever was inhabitation. But in the north as well, there's this constant, like, in the same way that I would say, actually, in, in in sort of more jungle climate, you know, you're, I mean, architecture is always fighting with climate. And, mm -hmm. and the failure of modernism, as people like Leather Barrow have said, is, you know, we want it to be pristine and nature, we're always fighting whether it's in cold or hot climates against, you know, the, the, the kind of uh, impacts of, of landscape. And I, mm -hmm. I think the kind of most powerful architecture is one that, that sort of welcomes it in and says, you know, we're working with you, not against you. <laughs> I'm replacing you. Exactly. Thank you. John Correa has a question. Go ahead. Thank you, Lisa. Um, so actually looking at the particular um, project where you're referencing the closed loop campsite, I found that project phenomenal. Um, I camp myself and I kind of like, um, as you go there, of course, it feels like it's very much like kind of a cost barrier for the middle class. One for access when it comes to vehicles or transportation and two, just because of the sheer cost of equipment to begin with. So I really am like obsessed with this project. But um, so look, at, I'm really interested in the more infrastructural component to this project, um, primarily to when it comes to, again, um, vehicular access. Um, I know like, for example, in our Western parks and when you look at the Alpine parks and sort of like um, Austria, Switzerland, they have these kind of public transit to trail programs. And I want to know if that's something that's existing in Canada or if this project is more kind of like in American national parks. Mm. Um, but um, I want to know if that's something that was considered for this project. And I'm also kind of interested in the kind of a thermal layering um, portion of the project. Um, is, and looking at your other project, I saw you integrated on geothermal tech and um, my tent, as many layers as I put, I still do need a heater. And I, especially in the far North, I can imagine. Is there a kind of um, geothermal component to it? I don't know if I missed that or I just really want to know. More. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, John, you need a heater because you're from Miami. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, frankly, Lola, Lola's from Montreal and she's always asking me, is it cold in here? I'm like, uh, but yeah, I mean, great questions. Wow. Um, I mean, you've picked up. I, I I feel like we I feel like we should work with John because I feel like you have some better ideas about how to get people to the site. I'll admit we there was a point there's a point where you're looking at a project and you kind of like if you radiate outward from it again like powers of ten. There's a point where you're like, how do we get this thing to fit fit with that thing? So I would not say we quite solved or have any running proposals on how to get people to the site and. I will also say that infrastructure in Canada is even worse in terms of transit. Like all, all movement is, is, is east-west. There is virtually no north-south movement by train or good connections by bus. Um, and many plane trips are actually once every two days. They're not even daily. Um, so, so they're not, and, and it's a wider territory with one-tenth the population of the United States probably one-tenth the kind of economic might of the United States. So uh, we don't have great investment in infrastructure here. So no, it's no, the, the parks here are no better uh, accessed, uh, unfortunately. I mean, this has no 
Well, I shouldn't say it has an architecture. I mean, there's actually the first urban national park was created in Toronto, precisely actually to address your observation, which is that you should be able to take transit to a national park. And so it's really just in the suburbs of Toronto. I think you can get there by subway. I mean, it's not like intense wilderness because you're still in the suburbs of Toronto, but you can hike, you can get there by transit. So people are starting to think the way you are. Yes. And then your other question about the geothermal. We did not because the idea was that these, we really wanted a kind of light footprint for these structures. We wanted them to be kind of ephemeral. You could demount them. Maybe you could update some pieces. So we didn't actually anchor them, but the thermal layers one did use almost like, you know, and I know Elisa knows this, but uh, in, in marathon running or after a long run, you have this sort of metal uh, uh, fabric, super thin. It's sort of like a heat retention. Yeah, a heat retention. So we were thinking of these sort of accumulation of many things thin layers of different um, performative fabric types in terms of water wicking, in terms of thermal retention, and that you could kind of peel almost more like an onion rather than uh, like a thick banana, and that you instead you could really get these thin layers to modulate that environment. Um, and also the, 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 the structure itself was a little tighter. It was not a, a, a large, the other benefit of course in the tent is the, the, the less amount of airspace you give to the tent itself, the more you can use your own body temperature to uh, heat that space up. So we didn't quite get specifically as um, uh, anchored within geothermal, but but um, there would be there was some more material ideas in that scheme than there was in, I'd say, probably the others with regard to performative qualities of materials thermally. Um, but there's still some work to do there. But maybe one footnote here, and, and I maybe this is a kind of obvious, <laughs> um, and I would say this is an early idea Lola and I had, maybe 2004 or so, we started working in serial ways. Lola mentioned that casually pre presenting one of the projects, but I'd say this is a bit of an obsession of ours, is that we're kind of interested in the idea of multiplicity. Um, and some people use, multi some designers use multiplicity as kind of like we study these 20 blue foam models to then arrive at this one idea. We kind of like this idea of there are nine ways we can think, nine possible answers. We're gonna explore all nine of them. Or there's 15 and we found these eight actually show the, the range of possible responses to that. We're gonna explore all eight, but we're not gonna go down to the bolt and, and nuts and bolts detail. Instead, we're gonna look at their impact socially. We're gonna look at their impact culturally, spatially, environmentally, politically. Instead, we like looking at those possible frictions or interactions that could occur across a set. Um, that, that doesn't apply to all, pro not all projects material is that way, but that way of working is a curiosity of ours, which is more like to, uh, yeah, release an album rather than a single is how I like to describe it. We were like, here's, here's nine tracks. I don't have a hit song in here, but here's nine tracks and they kind of form an album. There's a cohesion to them that we like, and we like the interplay amongst their singularity that they can can have a, a dialogue across them. That, that that way of working is a is a curiosity of ours. I think it's it's partly it it takes the pressure off any one project trying to like solve everything, um, and and. I always see them a bit of sketches, you know, so that as Mason said, they're not fully resolved, but it, they're also a bit like science labs. Like I always think about them as like, you know, okay, this one, you turn up the heat, this one, you add more sodium, this one, you, mm -hmm. you know, uh, agitate it more. And so in the end, you kind of maybe get a, a kind of complete or partially complete view of a question, having run these multiple quicker experiments um, whereas Mason said, you, you change the variable, whether it's programmatic or economic or social or material or whatever it might be. Awesome, thank you so much. Thanks. Um, yes, fantastic conversation. Is then, is, if there are no questions, I would just maybe ask one and, and I think we're at the hour. So um, I would just go ahead. The, premise of curiosity, which you just ended with, I would like to pick up in a, in a slightly different sense, which is what I would say is also a really uh, relevant word to use for your practice. That is a practice that uh, pursues curiosity in a almost, you know, beautiful and obsessive way that, you know, you're 
premise of wilderness for the Chicago Architecture Biennial takes you down a path, uh, you know, that's, uh, I think, led by, you know, we'll have nothing to give to the discourse on uh, tent design, but here's another path. And whether it's, you know, quote from Rainer Banham or perhaps many other uh, points of entry, I'm just wondering um, if you would say something to the students, because I, I would celebrate curiosity much more even than intelligence or, um, you know, it's such a democratic mm -hmm. gift that anybody can have. And if you pursue your curiosities, I feel that's, mm -hmm. you know, incredibly valuable and, and everybody can, can access that in a way. Um, yeah, I mean, I, it almost I, makes I, me think of, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I, I was just going to say um, thank you, Elise. I mean, I, I uh, of course, <laughs> maybe there's a childish quality to that curiosity too. But hey, uh, nothing wrong with that. Maybe that's how we try to stay young, right, Lola? Mm -hmm. um, is that I, I'm I'm thinking about um, uh, the difficulty of coming up with a good question versus like a question you don't know the answer to is the nature of curiosity. A kind of like, what does that mean? And mm -hmm. um, I think it's so hard today, and I'm I'm, uh, I'm I, I I can imagine even more so when every answer to every question is immediately at our fingertips. We feel like, I mean, and we all suffer from this whatever dinner conversation or casual conversation. Or let me just quickly look that up, and right, the internet delivers the answer to us. The answer is this. Um, it doesn't afford much for curiosity, but I think uh, we, you know, maybe useful questions are uh, can often begin with what if and and maybe some of those can get science fictiony um, but I, I think the what if uh, is a great starting point um, for thesis projects um, uh, design studios um, practice based questions I would say if someone were to ask what is the sort of abstract or premise of lateral office as a practice I would like to think somewhere in there, it would be what if the you know what if what if we were to um, you know rethink uh, wilderness what how we how we live in wilderness or how we live collectively in wilderness I feel like that what if is a, a useful um, uh, initial uh, start to um, a curiosity uh, question. I think I'd also just add, I mean, I think the North crystallized this for me at least, but I think the power of it is that it, it's true in any context. But I mean, in the North, we when we started, and I would say actually still today, like it was so, there was so much we didn't know. I mean, we literally started, actually, we knew nothing. We had never been there. We were just like, oh, there's, you know, Mason had been looking at Northern Russia. And then I thought, wait, why are we looking at Northern Russia? We have our own North. And that's how it started. And we just, you know, began reading articles and traveling and so forth. But but it became clear to me that you you couldn't do architectural research the way we're we we at least had been trained to, which is look at the site, you know, look at the where is the transit. Like it it made no sense that that you needed to do much broader research on how people use a space, how they use the inside space, how they use the outside space. You know, what is the impact of, of shipping? What is the impact of economics, etc. And but I would say that actually as part of this curiosity. I think we should bring that to every project. I mean, I've had students look at like Canadian suburbs, which one drives by a thousand times and sort of dismisses as like, yeah, I know what that is. And then, and then if you spend some time, it's as surreal as the North is. It's as surreal in terms of what weird things people are doing or how they're getting their internet or economies that are happening in people's basements. I mean, you can take, and I think that's sort of, part of what architects should be doing more of is, is not assuming we know the answers, you know, and not relying on types and precedents and actually saying, let's look closely and to Mason's earlier point, listen, maybe more to kind of uncover the, the strangeness. Cause I think it's in the, in the strangeness and then the surprising that there's the power to be both innovative but also maybe contribute to the discipline. Yeah, that's great. Um, there's actually more people that want to ask something. I don't know. Do you guys want to hang on for maybe five or six sure. more minutes? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Okay. Diana, 
somebody in your studio? Yeah, maybe, and also uh, set up this because you begin your lecture with kind of emphasizing this term new vernacular. And when we're talking about vernacular, it's very difficult not to think about Bernard Rudolfsky's 1964 uh, you know, exhibition at MoMA, Art Architecture Without Architects, and association of that with the way that we're starting to think about uh, engagement of public. So uh, do you want to ask a specific yeah. question? Yeah. Hi, thank you for such a refreshing lecture. Um, I wanted to ask, and it ties down with um, some of the questions, because this is um, an approach to a very remote and rural site. Um, thinking about the construction process, um, do you think about involving the community um, as you are you um, researching about the typologies of um, of the people that live there already. Um, have you thought about that? Um, or how would the construction process work? Yes. Um, I think absolutely some projects are more anchored specifically in how we can learn from construction techniques or kind of material culture. Others might learn from, let's say, more. Um, maybe oral forms of knowledge, or sometimes the conversation is influencing the program. So we didn't, we don't only see engagement with um, local knowledge keepers as just serving towards construction. Sometimes it influences how the building is organized. Sometimes it influences how the building is sited. Sometimes it influences how the building is sited and what materials can be used. Sometimes it influences the detail of a column and a beam. So we don't only see that form of listening as applying to the act of construction. Sometimes it, it influences um, model making. I mean, we, we incorporate it early on. And I would say the Arctic Indigenous Wellness uh, Center that we showed in Yellowknife, that project explored what maybe is a really exciting new area that we are not the only ones um, participating in this uh, exciting new way of working, which would be called co-design, where you're co collaboratively designing rather than seeing the architect and clients as a kind of hierarchy of an expert and, an, and a non-expert, instead inviting non-experts into the space of the design as a collaborative exercise. And, and there are many others, Elisa being one of them, and who participate, who explore this notion of collaboration, which is so exciting. So it can apply to material construction, and it can apply to programmatic order, to siting, to uh, environmental knowledge, to um, lots of information. But it's, it's a fantastic question you've asked. I would just say it applies to even more, a broader range of, of moments in a project, not only that end moment, not only the moment of construction, but the moment of um, conception of the project even. I mean, maybe one other thing I would add, I, th I, I think the, you know, the Bernard, Bernard Rudolsky reference is so mm -hmm. critical because um, it needs a new, it, uh, we need to revisit that. In yeah, fact, it's very problematic, right? It was, it, and in some ways, even like the way I, well, we didn't learn a whole lot about vernacular in my education, but when we, we did, it was always sort of building form and building materials. And then and then often implied was the sort of sustainability aspects, which are absolutely mm -hmm. worth celebrating. But it it I'm so aware in the Rodolsky book that there's no documentation of site. There's no documentation virtually of people, of how they use the space, of the interiors. And I think this is part of our interest in the spatial practice, expanding the notion of vernacular from purely the building shell to all the ways that it is co-opted, um, misused, adapted, transformed, um, and made by, by residents. And that's in some ways what the domestic circumpolar project was trying to document is, you know, even when it's an imposed structure, there's this kind of uh, vernacular uh, set of, of living practices that is pretty fascinating. Yeah, that's great. Uh, there, there's there's a question in the chat. Danielle, do you want to read it out loud or do you want us to just? Uh, sure, I can read it. 
that across there. I think it's, is it the one, uh, what types of sites? Uh, yeah, what types correct. of that's sites? Mm -hmm. Okay, what types of sites, natural or not, do you think we as architects are overlooking in our education? Well, I don't know your specific education, but I would say more broadly, um, I do not think we spend enough time in the education of the architect looking at uh, conflicted sites of conflict. Um, because they are very challenging and sites of conflict, you can look at that ecologically, environmentally, culturally, politically, and at any scale, right? A site of conflict can be uh, at the scale of a nation. It can be at the scale of a culture or peoples. But I, I, I would invite the possibility of bringing earlier into um, architectural education uh, complex and conflicted sites uh, in order to make are, are to make yourself as a student and as a future architect more nimble in, the, in understanding that architecture is about negotiation. Architecture is always negotiation. It's negotiation between a site uh, and, and, and uh, a building. It's negotiation between the past and the future. It's negotiation between a people that are there now, a people that will be there in the future. And it, it's always negotiation. So the more, the more adept and skilled you are as understanding your role as a negotiator, um, uh, spatial negotiator, I, I think the, the more your skill level will be and the more practice you have in that. So I, I would encourage more sites of conflict. And I think the more it subverts um, the idea of design being purely architectural will, which is how um, at least, you know, I was trained to sort of like, what, what do you want, you know? And, and I, I mean, I 100% think that design agency still matters. I think, you know, it isn't about in, in the face of all these challenges and com complex sites that suddenly design is irrelevant, quite the contrary. But it, it's that form is not the starting point. These other issues are, and then form is perhaps like the last part of the uh, and so it comes form isn't you don't add yeah. it's not like you say okay well now I'm going to make the form of this project yeah. the form comes through that process right, right. like that right. process yields form you can never not have form I mean the form always appears in a project it's just it's when you lead with it as the primary aspect where you're overlooking unfortunately so many other possibilities of invention because uh, if you lead only with form, your it, it will be always be the only way in which the project is read. Whereas if you're leading of a that form emerges in response to uh, a, 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 a addressing a challenge or a conflict or a programmatic possibility, some exciting things come out and some unexpected forms materialize um, or or masses or organizations um, come through that process. But, um, Inside relationships. Exactly. Thank you for the question. Well, yes, fantastic. I think um, thought for to, to, to end with on on today's twenty two of February of twenty twenty two. I hadn't realized two, two, that, two. but to <laughs> but um, it was a great duo presentation. You guys did not quibble or anything of the sort. So. It's gonna happen um, after. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we all really enjoyed it. I, I, um, I hope and I imagine we'll have conversations on the lecture in the hallways afterwards. Um, but tremendously Thank grateful. Thank you both, Lola Thank and Mason, you. for being here with us today. And um, yeah, to more Thank time. You so Thank much. you so much. Thanks for having us. Take Thanks, care. Tatiana, Tommy, and uh, Lisa. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. bye, -bye. I Bye, see you next Tal. Time. Thank you.